VAT um, generally clears a room. In fact, what I've done is I've arranged for a fire alarm. <laughs> I'm actually not going to talk about VAT um, much today. In fact, very little, perhaps towards the end. Um, I'm really going to talk about, almost from a layperson's point of view, about what the future might look like. And the inspiration, I suppose, for this um, has actually come from the speaker that's going to follow me, which is Carl Bayliss. Um, McIntyre Hudson went to see Carl's team at Centrica. And coincidentally, that same week, Thomas Cook went bust. And those two things together sort of made me think more about long-term future. And Carl's team was really interesting um, because within motor, I suppose we think about Q1, Q2, we might think a year ahead. And what Carl's team do is they think about not next year or the year after, they're thinking about 10 years ahead. And that sort of blew my mind a little bit to think, well, how do you even get that concept in your head as a business? And there's two things that Carl said to me about that. Or one is it frees, frees you up from the day-to-day -day stresses of targets and that sort of thing. But also it means the decisions you make now better be bloody right because these decisions are going to come to fruition in 10 years' time. So get it wrong today, you'll find out how badly wrong you were in 10 years' time, but you are badly wrong. So long-term thinking within dealer networks, how do we get there? I'll give you an example of a dealer I went to in September, I think it was, and I said to uh, the FD there, will you show me your charge points? What's your charge infrastructure like? And uh, he took me upstairs. I thought, this is strange. <laughs> I'm going upstairs to see charge points. <laughs> and uh, what he was going to show me was three-pin plug with a lead out the window. <laughs> and that was it. Now, the future can't look like that. Now, within the industry, we've had, I suppose, for a number of years, predictions of doom for the dealer network. Um, the internet, for example, how radically would that change the route to market? And it hasn't, has it? It hasn't radically changed it so far. Um, we're all going through stresses and strains, principally cyclical. But what I'm going to suggest to you in the next few minutes is that maybe e-vehicles is the trigger for something more radical. And maybe if we don't think more strategically and more long term, we are going to get left behind. It's not a doom-laden message, though, um, although you might think so by the next slide. Here's some names. Um, oh, I love Woolworths. I used to love them, but not enough people did. <coughs> so we end up with Amazon. And then Thomas Cook. So Thomas Cook go bust. Why do they go bust? Well, there's all sorts of questions about mismanagement that were raised uh, in the immediate aftermath. But my feeling is that Thomas Cook went bust not because of anything very recent, but because of decisions they did or didn't make 10 years ago. That Thomas Cook couldn't see what was down the, down the track. Or if they could see it, they weren't able to do anything about it. So Thomas Cook go, I'll book my last holiday with Expedia. Um, I'm going to mention House of Fraser. They're still around, of course. They're, they've got difficulties. I mention them particularly because this week in Birmingham, House of Fraser have announced that they're, for the first time in living memory, they're not going to create a Santa's Grotto. I mean, these are tough times. <laughs> so House of Fraser, yeah, still around. But also, what do we get? Someone like Boohoo. Records, complete change, records, says how old I am. 
<laughs> streaming. Something completely different. Something nobody would have thought about. And these examples got me thinking about what is it that enable people like Amazon to do things differently than people like Woolworths? What is it that made this radical change and made Amazon so successful? And I came up with four potential causes of success. Agility is certainly a very important one. So agility, um, fresh start, fresh thinking. So if you've been in a marketplace for donkey's years, you tend to be wedded to the ideas of what historically made that a success. You come to it fresh, fresh ideas, and able to move quickly with those ideas. So agility. Innovation's important. So in terms of Amazon, the principal piece of innovation wasn't theirs. It was the internet. But crucially, the Amazon recognized quickly that the internet wasn't principally or even solely about digital transfer of data or digital delivery of services. They recognized it was a means to get physical product out. Now, that was radical thinking. It's taken innovation. It seems just normal now. We just think, oh, yeah, of course. But at the outset, the inventors of the internet, did they think of that? Now, in terms of the high street and Amazon, they'll still be optimists to say, well, the high street will all survive. Um, good shops will survive because people like to shop. I don't, my wife does, that sort of thing. Uh, clothes, for example, people like to try them on, people like the feel of them. But what people do now, they go to clothes shops, look at the stuff, try it on, go home and order it online, because it's cheaper. Or the other way around, what my wife does, she orders it online, gets it home, decides to, she doesn't like it, and I get sent to Birmingham to take it back to the shop. Shops in Birmingham that I go to end up with more stock after I leave. <laughs> and even within clothing, you've got Boohoo are purely online. So it can be done. So whilst you might think about cars being an exception to all this, the cars are a touchy-feely experience. Well, yes, they are. And I, and I want to test drive. And I, I shouldn't say this in a room full of dealers. I'm about to buy a car. And, I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to that idea of going round showrooms and hands-on. But what if I decide to do that and then go online and order? And that's where we come to convenience. Convenience and Amazon is absolutely wedded together. I can shop to my heart's content and never leave my house. And that's perfect shopping for me. That's Christmas shopping heaven for me. And finally, taxation. So I'll come back to taxation and see how taxation has influenced those developing markets. So convenience and electric cars, this is a bit of a difficulty, isn't it? Electric vehicles are certainly innovative, so we tick a box there. And they tap into a perceived consumer need, and this is the idea of <coughs> cleaner living. I want to save the world. Actually, the way the market is now, or the way the technology is, the impact of EVs on carbon emissions are probably far less than people imagine, um, particularly in Europe. So the University of Liège um, did some research on this. Carl, you might have heard of this research. Um, that because of the carbon footprint of the battery technology, and then because you have to plug your car in and generate, and you're getting electricity off the European grid, which is still a major em emitter of carbon, 
Yes, electric vehicles are more carbon efficient than ice, but only after you've driven 435,000 miles. So actually, it's not as great as you think. If we get to a wholly renewable system, like Norway, New Zealand, maybe France, then we get to a figure much more realistic, 18,000 miles, and then EVs do become more carbon friendly. But almost irrespective of that, um, people believe that this is the future. They believe that this is doing good, good work. So they will start buying. Price is going to be an issue, though. But also convenience is going to be an issue. Because in my mind, thinking about this car that I'm going to buy next, I'm thinking about range, of course. But I'm also thinking about charging. I'm thinking about where do I charge it? If I bring it to McIntyre Hudson, will they let me charge it? Can I run a lead out their window? Well, probably not. I've got to install a charge point at home. I've maybe got to change my electricity supply to get the best rate. Centrica is there. So all those things are like playing on mind and think, do you know what, I'll probably this time, I'll probably just get another diesel because I can just fill it up down the road and I know what I'm doing, I've got the range. I think next time, I'll almost certainly be buying electric. EV just seems a bit of a faff to me at the moment. And, and like most consumers, I'm lazy. I just want something simple, something that's done for me. Now, I want to show you, um, I don't call it a disruptor, but somebody has come to market unexpectedly. And I, hadn't heard of, I hadn't heard of these guys um, in, in the vehicle sector. And it's these people. Um, not going to recommend them in any way. I'm just going to show you what they're doing. So Octopus are a electrical distribution company, and this is their this is extracts from their website. And what you can do on the website is you can buy cars, and there's a drop-down menu on there, which pretty much all the EVs available. You can think of it on there. So you go in onto the website, choose the car. At the same time, sign up to their particular tariff, the tariff that works for you. In terms, remember that your electricity bill is going to double probably as soon as you've got an EV. They'll get the charge point in for you, and it's all done in one go. Whereas I might come to a dealer and say, well, what about my charge point? Oh, well, you know, we know some people. Can you do better than that? Can you build relationships with the energy network so that when the customer comes to you, they've got this convenience experience? They've got this ready-to-go experience. The other thing I thought was interesting about Octopus, and again, this is technology is completely new to me, there's some sort of statistic. You know, I may have this completely wrong, but it's something like 11 fully charged Nissan Leafs can charge 1,000 houses for an hour. You think, well, that's a strange. OK, so what? Well, the point about that is there's loads of power stored in electric vehicles. And they're just, the power's just sitting there. So what Octopus have said, if you plug in your vehicle when you get home by about 6 o'clock, what we'll do is we'll take the power out of your car because that's when the grid needs it and then we'll recharge your car overnight when the grid is less in demand and what's more we'll pay you for the electricity that you've got in your Nissan Leaf wow I mean this is this is clever stuff that sort of thinking where I'm going to get £30 a month maybe makes me think oh well maybe electric vehicles are for me Cost is a thing, though. I love the planet, but if that car's going to cost me 10 grand more, I don't love it that much. 
And, and that's true more widely. In Norway, for example, Norway is our example of you know, great progress. In Norway, the overwhelming majority of people who bought an EV say that the number one reason was economic. It was nothing to do with saving the planet. It just made sense. And taxation is therefore a key to that. Amazon thrive because they get massive tax advantages. They get massive tax advantages because the governments are not quick enough with taxation policy to catch up. So Amazon get a niche, they get a foothold, and by the time the government's caught up, they're massive. So Amazon got uh, it's still got uh, advantages in terms of business rates against the high street. They got advantages in terms of VAT because they could locate in um, countries with lower VAT rates, for example, e-books, the development of Kindle thrived because of the low VAT rate on e-books in Luxembourg, where Amazon chose to locate. They were able to locate in advantageous locations for corporate tax without the world suddenly thinking, hang on, Amazon's now bigger than Africa. So taxation creates a fertile environment for those agile businesses to move quickly and grow quickly. And in, ta in vehicles, let's just have a look at that. I'm, I'm pressed for time, but I want to look at this, just an example of taxation. If we look at an ICE, there's our duty, typical diesel. On top of that, VAT at 20% 20, 20 adds another 21 pence per litre. Total tax per litre, nearly 80 pence, which average mileage, tax per mile, over eight pence. Every mile you drive a diesel vehicle. Now look at electric vehicle. Charge it at home. First thing you'll notice, VAT is 5%, not 20. Let's say it takes £8.40 to charge a 60 kilowatt electric car. That at 5%, 42 pence. Tax per mile, less than one fifth of a pence. So what we end up with is a comparison where it's, four, it's hugely different, hugely different. Now that won't last forever, but people who recognize that difference and use it will be the people who get ahead. Charging at home, fantastic. Charge overnight, fantastic. And finally, let's just look at the international. Should mention, of course, those revenues, 27.9 billion pounds from fuel taxes that will need to be replaced. So your 5% on electricity at home will have to go, or we'll have to have charging by the mile through technology. Something we'll have to give. Internationally, and I'll mention the B word here, within the EU, the EU isn't an agile body. I think we can all agree that. Within the EU, there is very little scope for messing around with VAT rates. Norway, on the other hand, outside of the EU, introduced a zero rate for VAT on electric vehicles and a 25% VAT rate for internal combustion engine vehicles. Now, that's something that post-Brexit would be available as a tool. Could be done. And it could be done even in um, a way which benefited the exchequer because you could raise more on the current ice market than you'd have to lose on EVs. I'll just finish with a, with a, with a quote for you just to make you think about... Um, this is an adaption of um, a, li a literary quote. The future is a foreign country. They speak a different language there. We've all got a ticket. We're all heading in that direction. Our challenge is to learn the language before we get there. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah.